Do you want to take a tracked Milky Way panorama just like the picture that's on your screen now? Then hang around, we'll go through all the processes and by the end of this video, you should be able to take your own tracked Milky Way panorama. G'day guys, welcome back to Nightscape Odyssey. So there is nothing more rewarding in my opinion than getting a nice Milky Way track panorama with a Milky Way arch. It's a good feeling when you finally uh, pull it off. Um, so I remember when I first started um, looking at Milky Way panoramas, I looked at YouTube and everything like that and everything seemed extremely complicated and everybody sort of explained things in a um, difficult way and made it sound more complicated than what it really is. So over time, I adapted my own um, style and techniques um, that allows me to get beautiful track Milky Way panoramas. And I'm gonna share that with you tonight or whenever you're watching this video. So not necessarily tonight. What we'll do is we'll run through apps, um, we'll run through the gear that I use, including brackets and panorama heads and everything like that, the star tracker. And we'll also run through the techniques that I use to get a track Milky Way panorama. So hang in there. By the end of this video, I'm sure you'll be able to do a nice track Milky Way panorama for yourselves. Um, before I do anything, I like to start with um, Google Earth and have a look around. I like to explore the back roads, the dirt roads, um, and I'm looking for anything that's going to be of interest um, as far as the foreground goes. I like to pick a location that has minimal trees because the trees are a big problem when it comes to editing. Um, and if you tried to edit around a tree, you'll know what I mean. But um, yes, starting here is, is a great great place to start. You can throw a little yellow man on the road um, and have a look from a different perspective to see whether you can get into a property, see what it looks like, whether it's even worthwhile going before you get in the car and actually going out there and physically looking. So this is where I start. This is my first point of investigation and once I'm satisfied with the location and the um, and the foreground I'll actually get in the car and drive out there and whilst I'm there I'll have a look at the Planet Pro app and investigate when the Milky Way is going to be above the structure that I want to, to photograph so um, let's have a look at Planet Pro and I'll take you through that So this is the Planet Pro app. Um, it's one of my other favorite apps I like to use to track where the Milky Way is gonna be at any one time. You can put your date and your time in and um, you can see what the Milky Way is gonna be doing um, at the time you go out there or plan to go out there. So it's a really good tool. It tells you when the sun's gonna set, the moon's gonna set, um, and also what kind of moon it's gonna be, whether it's gonna be a full moon or quarter moon or whatever. Um, you can also look at your VR, which you can see on the screen now, it gives you an indication of what the Milky Way is going to look like at the focal length that you have set. Um, you can change all your focal lengths back in um, the settings, so it will tell you how many shots you're going to need and how many rotations you're also going to need at what degrees. So it's probably worthwhile doing another video on this app because it's quite involved and um, it's probably more complicated than getting a um, the panorama itself but it gives you a good indication of where everything's going to be so it's definitely worthwhile purchasing this app Now this is Stellarium. I'm sure you guys would have seen this app before. I use this app to find the edge of the Milky Way, the corners, so I know where to start shooting from. You can also change the date range by swiping across and working out where the Milky Way is going to be at any specific time, so it's good. And you can also um, turn the Milky Way brightness up and down by clicking the button there, so that makes it darker and brighter. And it's a really good tool to find your edges, like I sort of said, and you can work out where you're going to start shooting from and where you're going to finish. So highly recommended app also. I want to talk to you about brackets and what to mount to the top of your star tracker. I know that part of it can be confusing too because you're not sure what bracket you want to mount and what's... Um, 
angles you're going to need in that. So um, luckily, I've worked it all out for you. Um, these are what I use. I mean, many, many different kinds of brackets. Um, I guess it's a personal preference. So this is what I use, and I'm happy to share it with you. So first bracket I use is a move, shoot, move, Z bracket. Probably didn't need the Z type bracket. I could have got away with an L bracket. That's what the L bracket would look like. But the Z bracket has another um, bit that actually bends up when it can get undone um, and almost drop it on the ground. But um, yeah, that's what a Z bracket looks like for obvious reasons. But um, I didn't really need the Z bracket. But this mounts on the front of the Star Tracker. Um, one thing I really like about it is this dial here, this wheel. Um, this allows me to um, counteract the rotation of the Star Tracker without having to undo the clutch. So um, it's really, really handy. I can use this to do a sweep um, and just do my fine tuning and re-leveling with, with this dial here. So highly recommended. Um, the L bracket also has this dial as well. So yeah, that's the, uh, the first bracket there. The second piece of kit that I recommend is an indexing panorama head. And this indexing panorama head is a game changer for um, track Milky Way panoramas just due to the fact that you can dial in what number you want which is actually your degrees um, that you work out so you could have a certain overlap um, on your lens um, which you can work out in Planet Pro which I did show you before um, and I will do another video on that it's just um, too much to add into this one video but I am um, in here I've got this set to 30 degrees and every time I rotate it will click a bit hard without having it on the tracker. So when you're out in the middle of the night, it's a game changer because you can just count the clicks and you know that it's 30 degrees every time it clicks or whatever degrees you set it to. With a bull head, you've got to turn your light on and you've got to look out and look at, try and find the, um, the increments on the, on the gauge. And it's a pain in the butt because every time you do that, and you turn your light on, you lose your night vision with your eyes, your eyes are gonna reset again and then go. But um, using this indexing panorama head is an absolute game changer for me. Last but not least is in another type of indexing um, panorama head, but um, this one's a tilt panorama head. So as you can see there, it's made, it's actually made by Ann Doa. It's about, from memory, about 50 bucks. And I got it from Timu out of all places. It's my first ever purchase on Timu, mind you, and it actually arrived, so I was happy. And it's actually good quality too. The equivalent to this is a couple of hundred bucks in a different brand. But this is also a game changer for me too, because you can actually tilt back and tilt your camera forward or down and lock it off. So you've got a big dial on there as well. So that is also a game changer, especially in the night, because you don't have to lose your position every time you crack that bull head. So um, they're the three most fundamental items in my kit to getting a track panorama. So what we'll do is we'll throw them on the camera and assemble them, so I'll show you how um, they look once they're on the camera. Here's all our brackets fully assembled on the Star Tracker. So um, you might be asking yourself now, why do I need all of these? Um, and, this, and the simple answer is just to simplify the process that I've found um, to make it much easier in the dark. So the first one I'll show you again is the tilt head. So all you have to do is just undo the tilt head and tilt up and down. So you can't move left or right. So you're not gonna lose your position. Secondly, 
the indexing panorama head. Um, I'll show you this. Um, hopefully you can hear it click, but it's set to 30 degrees. So every time I turn to 30, degree, 30 degrees, you'll hear it click. So I'll stop talking for a sec so you can hear it. So you can hear it clicking every time it hits 30 degrees. Um, so that's, um, that's been a real game changer in the dark for me. So. The next thing I'll show you is the Z bracket and that little dial on the front, which I mentioned before about counteracting the Star Tracker's rotation. So um, I'll show you that now. So here is the Z bracket. I'll move my shoulder strap out of the way, which I didn't really. So there's the Z bracket. Um, and what this does is obviously level and counteracts the, the angle of the Star Tracker for number one to give you a level base for your camera to sit on. And number two, we talked about this dial here on the front and that counteracts the um, rotation of the Star Tracker. Um, over time, what will happen is maybe after um, 10 minutes of shooting, your Star Tracker might have moved to about here. And what this bracket does here is allows you to undo that and move it back up again so to level it so you don't have to undo the clutch and bump your star tracker in between shots so that's why i've chosen that bracket um, it really helps me in the middle of the, in the middle of the night and when it's dark i don't need any light to readjust the only time i do is use a red light to have a look at the top of the level bubble on top of the um the bracket but that's it it's as simple as that so if you keep doing that every three or four minutes keep readjusting with this bracket here do another readjust, lock it off, and go again. And that's that's how I counteract um, the Star Tracker and not having to undo the clutch all the time. So that's um, my magic tip. All right, so here's our lovely picture that we're going to be talking about. What we'll do is we'll overlay a grid over this, and I'll discuss how I took this picture. So as you can see, we took the pictures from left to right and each tile represents um, a 60 second exposure ISO 3200 f 2.8 so once our 60 seconds is up then we, we rotate the camera 30 degrees in this instance to the next tile and then so on and so forth we keep going until we get to the end of our sweep um, and technically that should be where the arch of each side of the Milky Way meets the ground don't forget to overshoot the end of the arches because you're going to need all the room you can get when you process this image otherwise what will happen is you'll cut off the milky way and same goes for the top too you want to leave enough room at the top so i always like to just shoot an extra row just to be sure that it just does not get any compression or anything at the top so each row we went across the bottom when we got to the end of the image i then lifted the camera up and then did the reverse of what I did on the first row so I went back to the left and then again I overshot to make sure that I have enough to process in Photoshop later. Now just before we jump into talking about foregrounds I thought it was important to note um, why we do foregrounds separately to um, sky images and that's because the star tracker is designed to track with the rotation of the earth and it's continually moving when it's in the tracking mode so what that does is blur our background so when there is a tracked Milky Way image all those images you see are shot at different times. So the foreground is shot at a different time to the, um, to the sky shot or the star shot. So there are many different ways of doing foregrounds. Um, I personally like doing mine in blue hour, which is when the moon is just risen and the sun has gone down obviously and it casts a nice blue tinge over whatever you're photographing. So I, I like that. Um, and there is other ways of doing it and I, I highly recommend checking out um, Nightscape images 
um, on YouTube. I'll leave a link in below and I'll put it up on the screen now. Richard is really, really good at astrophotography in general, but not only that, he's great at fine art, light painting. What he does there is absolutely amazing. So check out some of the um, tips and tricks um, Richard has um, and see if you can apply that to some of your foregrounds. So what we'll do is we'll jump on the um, computer again. Now, similar to the sky shot, the foreground's much the same except I had to only do one sweep across because I didn't have to overlap the foreground with um, with any other rows so it makes it a bit easier. So I did nine sweeps across the horizon to the right and in each tile I did two focus stack shots so one focused off in the distance and one focused very close up in front of the camera basically down in front of the camera and I did this because it makes the foreground in focus basically everywhere so that's the reason why I did that and um, I was talking about the blue tinge from the moon as you can sort of see on the limestone rocks as well so in my opinion it made it look good so foregrounds are as simple as that their foregrounds the easiest part to photograph all right guys that's the uh, the process I tried to keep it as simple as possible there's quite um, a lot to talk about on that topic but um, I hope I simplified it for you um, do check out my polar alignment video as well which will go hand in hand with this video um, and like and subscribe to my channel it helps me get out in front of more people like yourselves and help people along with their astrophotography journey so thanks again for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video